Any questions? Anybody besides Joe to look at the uh, the swinging chair problem from yesterday? That that most awesome of all amusement park rides ever. Certainly better than that turntable one where they drop out the floor and it makes you sick in front of your astronaut brother-in-law, which makes you really look stupid. We'll get to that one later. Do you really have an astronaut brother-in-law? No, because he quit and is now teaching at the, at the Naval Postgraduate School. But quit, yes, yes, yep. He's been upon two shuttle missions and one six-month stay on the space station which meant once every hour and a half he was closer to me than he ever has been any other time because it's only like 260 miles overhead. Hi, John. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's my trial, my, my life. What do uh, astronauts do when they're not space? Brag, mostly. <laughs> Pick up girls in bars, I think, and put on weight. Only Joe looked at that. Only Joe has a question about that uh, swinging chair thing, man. All right, Joe. There you go. You can check it out there. All right. Any other open questions, though, before we get going here? All right. What we're looking at, if you remember, are... Uh, different types of forces because our number one tool right now for solving kinetics problems is Newton's law, F equals ma. Uh, by F, I'm being a little bit loose, I mean the sum of the forces. A lot of times in our problems there's just one, but if there's more than one, it's no big deal, we add them all up. It's all the forces together and whatever's left over, if anything, that will determine if there's any acceleration. So we uh, we looked at uh, at centripetal force yesterday. Uh, did we talk about spring force a little bit? I think I did just just real quick. And there's there's business in the book about it. It's uh, everybody's played with springs before. It's it's not like you don't know what they do. You just may not know how to quantify it, and it's pretty straightforward. So we'll spend a little bit of time on some, some other things as we go here. So what we're going to look then at today, well, let's, let's do a little force experiment here and see what's going on, if we can at all figure it out. Very simple setup. I've just got a little block of wood sets on the table. I attach a, a string to it. We know what strings do. Oh, they only pull. And then I've got a, a scale here to help me determine what's going on. So I'm going to put it there. And exert. Let's see, what's this reading? This reads in newtons. So I'm pulling with pretty much all my might right now. Three newtons. I should probably push my sleeve up so you can see, see the veins. Thing. No, you Bill could see it from there where he was. He, he could actually see it pushing out against my shirt. Oh man, that shirt rips open. I'm gonna lose my eyesight or something. So about three, three, three newtons. So let's see. Let's draw a free body diagram of that setup. Uh, the string is pulling on this little block with the weight on it by about three newtons. We read that right off the scale. Any other forces on it? Who's going to leap forward and take the easy one? Who did that? Nobody? Nobody wants to put somebody with their consent. Gravity. Yeah, well, wait. See, you got to be smart here and always jump in and get the easy one right off the bat. I've got about uh, 2,000 grams on there, and then that thing weighs maybe 100 or 200 grams or so. Any other forces? Normal force. The normal force. Otherwise, the weight would accelerate it down. 
So there's got to be a normal force. In fact, in this case, we we figure unless there's some other vertical forces that that uh, we don't have up there, and I can't imagine what they would be, then in this case, the normal force equals the weight. Not always. We need a free body diagram to check to make sure whether it does or not. But in this case, the, the uh, weight and the normal force happen to be equal and opposite. So uh, I'm pulling on it to the right with three newtons, but it was not accelerating. The only way that can be, oh, all the way up to four now. Yeah. Four. Ah. It's not accelerating. The sum, let's see, if it's not accelerating, if I sum the forces in the x direction, we'll let that be the x direction, that be the y direction. As usual, if, if we don't happen to specify it, we'll just take it as that, I guess. Um, there happens to be no x accelerate. Well, wait, how do I know there wasn't any x acceleration? I mean, did I measure it? Did I, did I run a little tick, ticker tape thing through it? File of last year. Well, wow, wow, isn't that high sounding? Because <laughs> it was just sitting there and that's all it was doing. If it was accelerating, we'd see it do something else a second later. I think that's what Mike meant. But he wanted to sound more important than that. So the forces then must also sum to zero. There's our first indication, at least in a quantifiable term, what you all know to be going on anyway. In fact, I think I heard someone say it. What's the force that's missing? Clearly, we don't have all the forces because I don't have any force up here that balances this one. There's got to be another one that balances, at least one more, that balances this force is equal and opposite in the other direction. Somebody said it. Who said it? Friction. friction. It's friction. Obviously, friction is pulling back in that way. We typically, just to remind us, it's a different force, and so we 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 uh, we don't just treat it like other ones because we're gonna have to do some other other stuff with it here in a minute. Uh, give it that little sort of script F for friction. Now, the interesting thing is, it appears to be adjustable. Let's see, I pull, pull with three newtons. The friction must be three newtons. I go up to four newtons. The friction must be four newtons. Five I try to trick it, I go back down to four, it catches that. I try to trick it, I, go, I, I, I try to distract it, I say, hey, look over there! And then go up to five, it knows, it, it's reading my mind, it knows what I'm doing. If we graph this, let's see, here's the force I'm applying, and I, I tried three newtons. I couldn't get much below three newtons because then just the weight of the scale itself tends to pull down too much. There's not even enough tension in the line to hold that. But the force I apply across there and the friction I calculate there, I'm not measuring the friction, I'm calculating it. All I can do is sum the forces in the x direction. I know what I'm doing, and I know friction's opposing it. If I do three newtons, then friction does three newtons. If I go up to four newtons, 
dang if he doesn't know I was doing four newtons. Makes this frustrating. Here, you know what? It's peaking, so I'm going to cover it. Okay, Joey, get ready. Damn it, Newt. It knew four newtons. It knows what I'm going to do. If I go to five newtons, man, I hate this. I can't get you guys to know what I'm talking about half the time, and this thing's reading my mind. It's got to hate that. It knows what I'm doing. One for one. What's the slope of that line? Huh? One. That slope of that line is perfectly one. Not sort of one. Not, not occasionally not one, one. Not one for me and 1.1 1 .1 for you. Because if, if that slope was anything other than one, then either this force would be bigger than this one or this one would be bigger than that one. And that thing would start to accelerate. It's perfectly one. It's right in my mind. It knows exactly what I'm going to do. Even everywhere in between, because this is an analog scale. Everybody know what that is? Analog scale. Uh, uh, analog is a scale that can read any possible value, whereas a digital scale could only read certain values. This is an analog scale. I can hit, not only do I hit three newtons, four newtons, five newtons, I can hit absolutely every little miniature tiny bit of a newton in between. It knows exact, well, six. A new record. God, this thing's reading my mind. Perfectly reading my mind. Perfectly reading my mind. It knows exactly how much force I apply. It won't apply any more, and it won't apply any less. So I go to Whoa! Something happened there. Something. Where did it happen, Joey? Happened about seven. Now, well, now we got things going. Now, now things are sliding a little bit. There's a lot of chalk all over here. Uh, so now, sometime or, or other, I get to a point where I can actually pull it hard enough, and it starts to accelerate now. Oh, you know what? I think we had a goober right there that was stuck on. But you know what? That's important to us. We, we need to know why it moves and why it doesn't. So now, it looks like we get can't hit five or six anymore for some reason. Now it starts to move. Unfortunately, I don't have the table I want. There's five. Hit five a little bit. Oh, and then it even dropped down. Got to five. Or dropped down a little bit. So clearly, there's a limit. And you know this. If you've ever tried to push a couch across the floor or something, you got to. You, if you don't push hard enough, it doesn't go. You got to push harder and harder until it starts to go. And then once you finally get it going, what happens? Huh? You ever moved a couch? It's yeah, it's actually, once it gets moving, isn't it actually easier? Some, there's just too much garbage on the, on the, on the floor there. Sooner or later, it breaks free and the friction force actually drops down. And as we apply more force, now it starts to accelerate. That's much harder to work with because we have to test well, how much force do I have to apply for, for constant velocity where I can have it moving but not accelerating? Or how much force do I have to apply to get it to accelerate? It's a much trickier thing 
But what we find is once it's moving, if we could be sensitive enough to do that test, we find that the friction force would never change and we can very easily get above the friction force, give that, some, that thing some pretty good acceleration. So it appears that we've got two things going on. We had this region where nothing would move. That's when I couldn't pull it hard enough to get it to move, but it always pulled it back exactly what I did every time it pulled back against me. Then we have this region here where the friction force actually drops down. You know that from shoving couches across the across the floor or whatever it was you were trying to steal that day. Uh, where, where actually things are moving. This is a static region. Static means no acceleration or no movement. This is a kinetic region where things are moving. So we did that with three, and then we did four, and then we got up to five, and then it started moving, and then things got a little goofy here on the surface somehow, I'm not sure why. And then we could get things moving. So let's uh, let's let's see if we can't try something out. Also, let's let's get a uh, a reading here with our new slippery surface, whatever it is, happens. So about four and a half, right, Joe? And then things start to move. Try something a little less here. Two and a half. That's not big news, is it? Isn't it easier to slide? When you need to slide your couch across the floor, do you want your drunk Uncle Earl sleeping on the couch when you do that? No, you say, get your butt off, go get a job. I gotta move the couch. Because the couch is being moved. You don't want to push Uncle Earl across the floor because he's gonna make it too hard to push that. So it seems like it seems like friction has something to do with the weight. Does that seem reasonable? If I put both of these on, what were we at with just this one, Joe? Four and a half? Yeah. Now we're back up to five, six. Oh, and then you see when it started to move, you see it drop down. pretty hard to do it. This is a, a real rough surface. But now we're all the way up to six or something. It appears that that the friction, well not the friction, not the static friction is always one for one, no matter how much I'm towing, isn't it? Because I never have any acceleration. No matter what I'm trying to tow, I never have acceleration. Whether I'm here or whether I take that one off, as long as I'm not moving, I must not have any acceleration. It's always one for one. But it appears like this highest point I have to pull might have something to do with, with the weight. Is that what it seems like? The heavier it is, the higher I have to go, the higher the load I have to exert before it'll finally break free. Does that seem reasonable? Maybe maybe we draw it uh, something like this. Here's my force. There's friction force. If I don't have very much weight on there, just the one little one, then I don't have to pull very hard before it breaks loose. But if I have more weight on there, I've got the big one, or I've got the two of them together, it appears like I've got to go a little bit farther before it breaks loose. Before that, to the left of that peak, it's always one to one. 
the friction is always one to one with my pull because uh, that's the zone where it's not accelerating. So it's this peak here that seems to be of interest. How can we predict what that peak is going to be? Before that, there's nothing to predict. It's doing the predicting. It's one for one what I apply. I apply three, it applies three. I apply 3.269, it applies 3.269 back. But that peak, this, let's call it, let's call it the maximum static friction. That's the, the, the maximum friction I can, that's the maximum force I can apply before it finally breaks loose and is no longer in the static region, it's now in the kinetic region because it's starting to move. If it's starting to move and it wasn't before, it accelerated. Seems like that point would be of interest. Maybe it's not something you'd actually calculate when you're trying to move your couch, but if you're trying to calculate whether you've got a good design for snow tires or uh, how much friction is in a machine in the bearings or in the belts or something when you're part of that engineering design team, seems like that kind of thing might be of interest to you. What is this? maximum static friction. If you can calculate it, then you can take it into your design calculations to a better design. Seems like it has something to do with the weight, doesn't it? So we'll put a, a question mark there because it seems like it has something to do with the weight. However, let's try it again. I've got the weight down, the force I'm applying there, and what we're trying to find out is what's the maximum force I have to apply to finally get the surfaces to break loose and the object starts to accelerate. It doesn't accelerate for long because I can't pull it for very far before it's off the table. But once it's at that maximum amount I have to pull, I know that friction's at its maximum amount. Because until that point, they're one for one. So it's very easy for me to indirectly measure the friction. So I'm looking to see when's the maximum static friction. Uh, clearly, just double check. It's not accelerating up or down. There must be some normal force up that's equal to the weight. And I'm looking now, what's the maximum force I apply? Because that's the maximum force that the friction reapplies back to against me just until it takes me to break the surfaces loose. So now I'm going to do a test, a little bit of a test here. I just want to double check something. All right, here we go. Let's see. Let's see if we can get some consistent results here, Joe. About eight. Okay, we'll try it again because it seems to act silly after moving. About five and a half. There must be some something on this surface that if it sits there a while, it kind of gloms onto it, and then once I get it moving, it, it uh, isn't there. So let's. So somewhere between five and a half and six, right? And then it starts to move. Phil, you agree with that? Something like that, unless we let it sit for a while. So I won't let it sit for a while. Five, five and a half. So somewhere around five and a half or six, it'll start to move again. I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna press down on this. Now what's its weight? Has the weight gone up? 
How'd the weight go up? What's my fingertip weigh? Depends on whether it's just been in my nose or not. Doesn't weigh much. I'm pressing down. I can press pretty hard. What's the weight of this? Does my finger change the weight of that? And I still want to ask. Answer my question. Don't pull an owl on me. <laughs> what happens to the weight of this, the little board and the two masses there, when I press down? What happens to the weight of those things? Nothing. Nothing. Is there a new force on here that I need to draw in? Well, yeah, of course. It's my finger. So I'm pressing down on it with uh, one finger worth of force. Maybe we'll call that FF. This better give this a, a, an F applied, force applied. That's the pull there we got going sideways. There's my finger pushing down. The weight doesn't change because that's a factor of the mass of the uh, of the thing sitting there. That hasn't changed, so why would its weight change? Does anything else need to change now? The normal force. It had better get bigger because it needs to be that big plus that big. That normal force has to equal the weight we had there plus the force I'm exerting with my finger. Yeah, my finger has a little bit of mass, but not much. So now let's see what happens, Joe. Let's retest it since we see it gets funny when it sticks for a little bit. All right, so that's six at six. Six and a half. Now I'll press down. I'm gonna I'm gonna blow a gasket here in a minute. I wish Malcolm was here. One more time, one more time. Ma Malcolm could do this, couldn't he? Yeah. Malcolm lifts weights. He, he tells us that. There's <laughs> one, huh? It's probably got an app that do it. There's funny. That's like a world record if I ever saw one. So I don't think, since the weight didn't change, and the maximum force I had to apply is clearly, in fact, it's off the scale now. I still could, I couldn't even get it to move. It doesn't appear the maximum friction has to do with the weight. It appears more likely it has to do with the normal force. Because that increased and that did increase the maximum static friction I had to apply. And we can do a lot of other tests that are much more quantitative than that. I don't know how much force I pushed down with. I don't know how much the normal force went up. But if we could test this much more carefully, we would indeed find that this maximum peak point here, this maximum static friction, would indeed be a factor of the normal force. In fact, they're directly proportional. So I could write, instead of that little squiggle, which means has something to do with, I could actually write is proportional to. Have you seen that symbol before in math? Some of you have and some of you have had in my bet. It means is proportional to. Means that this peak 
is a linear function of the normal force. If I double the normal force, either by doubling the weight or putting the weight on and pushing down with the same amount of force equal to the weight, either way, uh, if I double the normal force, I'll double that peak maximum friction. It's tough to show with this little thing on a, on a crummy tabletop, but uh, if we could do that test carefully, that's indeed what we'd see. Anytime I have a symbol that means is proportional to, I can take that out, replace it with an equal sign and a constant. Then I can make a direct calculation between the two. It turns out we call that the coefficient of static friction. This must be an absolute. No, that's a mu. It's it's a Greek letter mu. It's it's much like a U with a real long front tail. Our M came from that, but that's a, that's a Greek letter mu. Remember, we never write out these Greek letters. The little S reminds us that's the limit of the static region. So if I, uh, if I do anything to increase the normal force, which means I, I could increase the weight, that would increase the normal force, or I could apply more force here downward myself, that would increase the normal force. Anything, of the, any combination of those is going to increase where this peak happens. The bigger the normal force, the higher up this line goes. This one for one line just keeps going higher and higher and higher the higher the normal force gets. And in fact, for static friction, we could say static friction itself, now notice I don't have any max written on there, static friction is always less than or equal to mu s times n. Equal to, because we're at the maximum point, any other thing than that, we're down somewhere on this one-for-one one slope. So we've got this maximum static friction equal to this, this coefficient of static friction uh, you got to figure we gotta, we're going to have to know something more about that, but for right now, it's, it just turns out that it's a, it's, we do this measurement, we, we set the normal force to something, measure how much static friction, we do that for a whole bunch of different normal forces, measure the maximum friction force, and then we can calculate that static coefficient. We could do that uh, in the lab if we didn't have so many other busy things to do. The other region of interest, I guess, is this kinetic region where once it's moving, it turns out no matter how hard you pull, the friction force pulling back is pretty much the same. It doesn't really change. It wobbles a little bit. But if I pull 8, 9, 10, 20, if I get Malcolm in here and go to 25, if I get Malcolm and Samantha, we go to 29, it doesn't matter, the static or the kinetic friction will be pretty much the same, no matter how much more I apply. So we can also say there must be some kinetic friction that we could calculate. It is also proportional to the normal force, 
but it turns out the proportionality constant is different. Uh, well, you can see that because this friction force tends to drop down. In fact, uh, in every situation I can think of, mu k is less than mu s. If nothing's accelerating yet, if nothing's broken loose, if we don't have this one surface sliding over the other, there's going to be more friction than when we do get things moving. And that's what you experience when you shove something across the floor. You try to get a refrigerator moving or something. Big effort to get it moving, but then you try real hard not to let it stop again because now it's a little bit easier until you get it to where you're going. You know that from pushing stuff across the floor. So let's see, uh, maybe a little bit more word about these coefficients. They're both very much the same in that they're essentially constant, but there's some things we really need to understand with these coefficients. So let, let's be a, more, a little more thorough. We'll say coefficients of friction, whether static or kinetic, there's a couple things that are true. Besides just the generality that the kinetic is generally less than the static coefficient of friction. Um, what you have to realize is when we talk about the difference between this static region and this kinetic region, we're only looking at one thing. We're not looking at the object necessarily itself and whether it's moving or not. Because I could do the same experiment by, by somehow holding this thing still and pulling the table underneath it. And I would still get the same kind of friction measurements there uh, if I could do that without, uh, without much difficulty. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not a factor of whether this thing is moving or not. It's a matter of whether these two surfaces in contact are moving over each other. It's this little wooden block moving over the tabletop that's important. That's the difference between the static region when those two surfaces aren't moving over each other and the kinetic region when those two surfaces are moving over each other. We don't look at the object and whether it's moving or not necessarily. What we look at is the two surfaces in contact. In fact, this depends very, very much on surfaces in contact. Remember I told you friction was a contact force? We only have friction if we have two surfaces in contact. If those surfaces are not moving, and I mean not moving relative to each other, not moving relative to each other, I don't care which one's actually moving, which object. I don't care if one object's moving and the other isn't. I don't care if they're both moving a little bit. All I care is about what's happening at the surfaces in contact. That's where the friction is, and that's where our concern is. Not moving relative to each other, that's a static friction situation. If they are moving relative to each, not over, other. That's a kinetic friction situation. That's the dividing line between these two regimes here. You look at the two surfaces in contact where the friction is. Remember that the normal force is also a contact force, a two, two surfaces in contact. 
And in this case, we're talking about the very two same surfaces. It's the normal force at the surface where the friction's occurring that we're talking about here. One other thing is very true about these coefficients of friction. Depends very much on what the surfaces are. You know that. If, if uh, I'm trying to pull something across the floor and then I come in and, and I, well, we even saw it change somehow here. There's something weird that's on the surface. If I was really serious about this, I'd have to clean these surfaces. I'd have to clean them off with alcohol. Let them dry. Be very careful where I touch them because all kinds of weird stuff can happen. But if I, uh, if I, if I grease the table, you know, if I, if I let you guys borrow the table from... How many of you guys are living alone, not living at home anymore? Joey? So if I let you bother this table, because bachelors don't know how to clean anything. I let you bother, borrow this table for, for, say, a week or two, it'd come back pretty greasy after that, wouldn't it? There'd be, there'd be spaghetti, chocolate milk. Yeah, there we And so... We have entirely different test values for the for the maximum static friction and the kinetic friction it took to get that to move over itself. If I uh, if I took the surface and I laid over it a real sticky foam rubber or something, and then reran the test, that'd be completely different again. It very much depends upon what surfaces are in contact. It's very different, wood on formica, or in Joey's case, wood on greasy formica. Or, say, rubber on asphalt. That's a pretty important one, don't you think? Because that tells you how well your car tires stick when you're going around corners. We know that if we don't have enough friction force on a corner, you can't go around the corner. We were looking at centripetal force the other day. Very much depends upon what the coefficients of friction, or what the surfaces are that are in contact. Well, what would be nice then is if every time we needed to do some kind of friction problem where we have some problem that we understand friction to be a part of it, it'd be very nice if we didn't have to retest it every single time we have two surfaces in contact. It'd be nice if somebody would test some surfaces, some, say say rubber on steel, or, or uh, uh, tennis shoe rubber on ice, or um, concrete on asphalt. Any of the, it'd be nice if somebody would do that test for us and then just let us know what the coefficients are so we can do the calculation. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, it turns out that a lot of those calculations have been done. A lot of those tests have been run. And this is the only way you can get these coefficients is to do the test. In your book on page 175, if you have your book uh, if you don't, I can put it up on the screen. Why don't I go ahead and do that anyway? Anything yet? Patrick, you're the one close enough. <laughs> Nothing yet. Projectors on. It's showing up on my 
the screen here. If my, my, everybody wants to come up and gather around my monitor. Let's see, it's set on document, Cameron. Is uh, the light there in the right spot? What? Oh, I don't know what I did. Huh? Your mom. Yeah. So, no, the, the, the screen is there. That, that's just how much light. Uh, that is looking at you, isn't it? No, it's not the lens is here. So that's not the case. I think. Yeah, it's not the case. Yeah, it's not the case. not the case. I think we don't actually have this. Oh, let's see, where's my choice here? Oh, here we go. And oops, it just went off. It was blinking green before. Blinking green, don't worry. And now it's blinking green again. There we go. It was just, it was just sleep. See if you don't bring your books. I want to have to do this. There we go. Kinetic and static coefficients. So we see mu k. That's kinetic. What does that kinetic mean again? That K? What's that mean? What's moving? The two surfaces relative to, the other, to, to each other. I don't care what object is moving. I don't care whether the surfaces in contact are moving. Static coefficient means they're not moving. The two surfaces are stuck to each other. Steel on steel, well that's the kind of thing you'd want to know if you were building some machinery. Like, uh, like this is what's going on with your pistons in the piston cylinders in your car. These are actually kind of high numbers, so you might want to put some oil in your car to decrease that a little bit. That would be then lubricated steel on steel, which would be a very different number. Um, Copper on glass, boy, some very important ones here. Ooh, rubber on concrete, there we go at the bottom. That's your car tires on the road surface. We get pretty high coefficients of friction. About the same, but the static one is definitely, uh, definitely greater. As most of you, well, that's why you don't want your tires spinning because the static coefficient is higher than the kinetic coefficient. And if the tires are spinning, your tires are spinning on the road surface, that's a kinetic friction situation, and typically the kinetic friction is less. It's saying there they're both about one, but, uh, uh, it, well, maybe with concrete it is about that. With asphalt, it's very definitely true that the kinetic coefficient is less than the static coefficient. And if you need other numbers than that, there's a whole bunch of other publications uh, that will tabulate a whole bunch of those things. So you don't have to always look them all up. All right, so we need to do some problems with that. Where are they? All right, so let's let's uh, let's try a couple problems here. Another one with my car in it. We like to drive my car places. So here's my car. <coughs> About a thousand kilograms. Am I in it or am I not in it? Well, you don't know. It's a trick question. A thousand kilograms. I'm going about 30 meters per second. I slam on the brakes, lock up the wheels. So I'm skidding now. Lock up the wheels because I panic when I, when I need to stop. I'm like you guys, you know. If I'm not squealing the tires when I stop and squealing the tires when I start, I'm not going to meet the girl of my dreams. 
So you got to squeal those tires, fellas. So I lock up the wheels and I'm skidding. Coefficient of friction between my car tires and whatever surface I happen to be on, let's say it's 0.8. kind of low, uh, much lower than rubber on concrete was, so maybe I'm on a, a dirt road or roads we have right now, there's a lot of grit on them, that's going to lower the coefficient of friction, it's a lot easier to get out when there's grit all over a road. And of course I do that to bring myself to a stop. How far do I travel in that skid until I come to a stop? There's my question. Before we've done problems where somebody's moving and then they're not moving and we could figure out the acceleration or the distance or any of those type of things we needed. Now, though, we're talking about what force is it that causes me to stop. I've locked up the tires. My tires are skidding over the road surface. So there's a big friction force backwards. That's what's slowing me down. Is that kinetic friction or static friction? Joe says kinetic. Tyler, what? You agree? Yeah, my tires are skidding over the road. The car is moving, but that's not what matters. What matters is what are the two surfaces doing with each other. So my tires are skidding over the road surface. That's a kinetic friction situation. I want you to figure out how far I'll skid before I come to a stop. You remember taking driver dead and they said, Stopping distance at certain speeds is so far as if you can calculate that when you see the little boy run across the street chasing the ball. I always do those calculations real fast, and I, but by the time I'm done, I'm hitting. Saying, "Dang, there goes there goes one more tuition dollar just lost there." All right. How are we going to do this problem? How are we going to get to this distance traveled? Let's see. We have uh, initial velocity, final velocity. We're looking for distance. That kind of sounds like the constant acceleration problems we were doing. Right? And remember, I told you this this friction force when the two surfaces are sliding is fairly constant. So if the forces are fairly constant, the acceleration is fairly constant. So we could do this as a constant acceleration problem. So we have initial velocity, final velocity. We're looking for distance. It's a constant acceleration problem. How do we solve constant acceleration problems, remember? Yeah, we've got those four equations, but to work the four equations, what do you need? I already said constant acceleration. You need three things. There's five possible variables. We've got three of them involved. Two we have, one we're looking for. So we need one more variable. before we can find the one thing we're looking for. We need one more thing that we know before we can do this as a constant acceleration problem. Remember, there's only five possible variables in a constant acceleration problem. 
We've got three of them, so there's only two other possibilities. What are they? Time. How long is this acceleration going on? Or the acceleration itself. We need one or the other of those. Then we could know then we know what equation to use. We just look it up on our table and find the distance we travel. Which one of those can we get? And how? We need either the time it takes to come to a stop or the acceleration we undergo to do this stop. What good will that do? Because that's not either one of these. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking you, what good will that do? If I, I can, I can find the force of friction. Uh, I've got the kinetic, but what good will it do? We're we're looking for either the time or the acceleration. Then we can do this. Then I can find the distance. I got to find either one of these. Which one can I find? Now, Mike was throwing out some stuff, but I don't know that it was going anywhere. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just not sure it was going anywhere. Don't you find the force of friction? You can do the sum of the forces and the MA. When you can solve for A and that, that gives you the mass. Okay, hang on, let's see. Uh, sum of the forces. Uh, now, uh, let's do the usual. Let's call that X, call that Y. So the sum of the forces in which direction? Why the X direction? Well, it's because uh, we're looking for acceleration in the X direction. This delta S is actually in the X direction here, so it sounds like we at least ought to start there. In fact, maybe that's what we're looking for. That would be our acceleration in the X direction. You can change this S to an X if you want. No big deal, it's just an arbitrary choice of a letter. We've got the mass. If we can find the acceleration, we can do this problem. So it all depends over here if we can sum the forces in the x direction. What do we need before we sum the forces? Phil, now give me your usual answer. What do we need to best sum the forces? A free body diagram, because if we don't have the right forces and we don't have all the forces in the problem, how are we going to sum the forces? You can't just guess at them. We got to we got to think and make sure we got them all. Any forces? Sorry, Bill. There you go. Any any forces on the car? Who spoke up for it? Who grabbed that one? Good. See, now Phil, Phil's starting to figure out how to avoid getting called on later. Jump in. Just say wait. Anytime I ask a question, just say wait and then go back to sleep. Any other forces on that car? Yeah, it got to be a normal force. Otherwise, uh, it would accelerate towards the center of the Earth. Normal force between what two surfaces? Remember, normal force is a contact force. What? Yeah, the tires and the ground. Those are the only surfaces in contact. In fact, uh, that's our, uh, our surfaces of interest. Any other forces? Friction. Which direction? opposite direction of the movement. What we have here is the stationary ground 
the car tire, remember the car tire is not turning. It's moving, but it's not turning. So this surface is sliding over that surface. Friction opposes that. So the friction will be back that way. And we'll put a little K on it because this is a situation where the two surfaces are sliding over each other. Yeah, the car is moving, and yeah, the wheel's moving with the car, but the two surfaces are what we look at. One surface is sliding over the other surface, that's a situation of kinetic friction, no other ways about it. What other forces? Don't bother summon the forces until you're done with the free body diagram. What other forces? The what? The applied force, right? What applied force? From the tire to when it's moving, but it's not standing. It opposes friction. Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> now remember, it's it's got to. Anytime we put a force up there, you got to tell me what's causing it. Phil, oh, you're awake again. You're gonna just say normal? No, you're gonna say wait. Go back to sleep. No, it's um, the force caused from your um, previous movement. So I can go put my hand on the previous movement. <laughs> Well, you can stick your head out and get hit by the car in 30 meters per second. It's fucking not. Huh? Well, it's, the car is moving before it slides on the brakes, so it had to have some sort of self. Oh, so I can go back here before I put the brakes on and put my hand on the previous movement. I, I could roll down the back window, stick my hand out the back, touch the previous movement. Bill, you want you want to just say wait and leave it at that? <laughs> I'll say wait. Don't forget, no forces go on here unless you can tell me what I can touch that causes that force. I can't touch previous movement. I can't touch acceleration. I can't touch circular motion like we were trying to do yesterday. We wrestled with that a little bit. Forces are only caused by ropes. Surfaces, uh, people reaching in and pulling or pushing. So what other force? That's it. That's it? Sooner or later you're done. You can't keep putting forces on forever. Sooner or later you're done. We're done. There are no other forces in this problem. So, sum the forces in the x direction. Let's see. That's the x direction. That's the force in the opposite direction. So, it's minus F, K. The minus, because I chose to the right positive, and this force pushes to the left. There aren't any other forces in the x direction. Mass times acceleration in the x direction. Well, that's what we're looking for. So we've got the mass, but what about this friction force? How big is it? If we can't figure that out, we can't figure out this acceleration. How big is that friction force? You have new kinetic. Uh, huh? Well, you have new kinetic. Okay, sure do. So, uh, well, friction and kinetic equals new. Oh, yeah, kinetic. right there. So, that might help a little bit. Minus still stays there. Minus mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction, times n, the normal force. So, I don't know, maybe we're a little bit closer. 
Well, we don't have the normal force. Where do you get the normal force? You get the normal force from your free body diagram. There's no other place to get it. In fact, we need to sum the forces in the y direction. Well, there is no y acceleration. It's going on level ground and continues to do so. So I know in this case, n equals w. If the ground isn't level, n doesn't equal w. So don't just assume that. In this case, n equals w. Remember how we find w? Did I give it to you? Yeah, mass, we got the mass, we don't have the weight. mg equals max. Oh, look at this. Mass of the car doesn't matter. What does matter then in determining stopping distance if the mass doesn't matter? What matters most is what kind of tires do you have on what kind of surface? That's what matters the most. Oh, also matters which planet you're on. For some of you, we're not sure where that is. Now we can figure out the acceleration. Now you can figure out the stopping distance. So go ahead and finish the problem. Take a couple seconds to finish the problem. Figure out the acceleration. Then we've got a good situation here. We don't need the time, nor do should we find it directly. We can find the time once we found the acceleration, but that's just a, an exercise for the need of find out what was what, what, what I did. I, I'm not sure. Want to look at that some more? Okay. Come on, we're heading towards that little kid. Finish the calculation. Remember, we're looking for delta s. Oh, oh. Yeah, you're saying, oh, oh, that little kid stands with his eyes real big. He's frozen solid. He doesn't. He can't move. Check with anybody. Do you know anybody's name in here? Check the acceleration. How do you know it's right? Because if the acceleration's not right, then your delta s isn't right. Maybe make those delta x. Since we did pick that in the x direction, it's arbitrary what we call them, but we might as well be consistent especially since we're taking notes in chalk. Here's So that's going to be what? Two 
two stops, three stops maybe. Stop to pick up more of the pizza. Or both. And you agree? Mark, who'd you check with? Nobody? Are you, can, you know what to do here? That I gave you. That's on your calculator. G is what it always is. So you can find that. Then when you find that, there's three things you know. One thing you don't, use your constant acceleration equation. Did it work? Check with somebody? No? Len? Can agree? Who'd you check with now? Can you agree? Tyler? You guys agree now? Yeah. Patrick? Almost? What'd you get for A, just to make sure? Nope. 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 What? What? Is it negative? Negative. Point. There we go. Got it all finally. Minus. 7.8, was it 85 <coughs> meters per second? What's the minus mean? It's a negative direction. Yeah, it was, we picked the positive direction as x. The acceleration is negative to the left, what we typically call deceleration. Now that you've got the acceleration, it's now just a constant acceleration problem that you can finish and we got for a stopping distance fifty seven point four meters which is lucky the kid was standing at fifty seven point six meters so scared the hell out of him which is cool Teach him a lesson. Don't run out in the street. All right. We don't have much time. I don't see you until Monday, so I have to give you something that will consume at least several hours over the weekend. See if I can keep you busy enough to keep you out of jail. So here's the problem. There's a, a wall and a floor, and on the floor, I have a two kilogram box. On the two kilogram box, I have a one kilogram box. The one kilogram box is tied to the wall with a titanium cable. <laughs> you, so F you, are pulling on the bottom box with your full might. 20 newtons. That's my full. And I, actually, I, I redlined the scale today at 20 newtons. Yeah, I did that. I want you to find, oh wait, two more things. Coefficient of friction right there. 
mu k is 40, 0.40. Coefficient of friction right there. Remember, anytime two surfaces are in contact, there can be friction. UK is also 0.4. What's that tell you the bottom box is doing? Moving. Otherwise, we wouldn't have kinetic friction, we'd have static friction. Because if it's moving, it's moving over that surface and it's moving under that surface. So find two things. If you don't, don't bother coming for the rest of the semester. And that's the last week, next week before spring break, isn't it? Man, yeah, things are flying. You got any zeros in the grade book, you better fix them. Find the acceleration of the two kilogram box. What's the acceleration of the one kilogram box? Zero. Zero. It's tied to the wall. And find the tension in the cable back here. Titanium is expensive. I don't want to buy a thicker cable than I need to. Got the problem? All right. Have a tattooed on your forehead when you come on Monday. If I see it there, you can come in. If I don't see it there, you can't come. Oh, Tyler, where's his hair over his forehead? What are we going to do? Haircut. Good thing. Yeah, haircut. Alan's got a hat on. Good thing we don't have bigger equations to tattoo on your forehead. You need a forehead like mine. <laughs> That's why when you get into graduate, graduate school when you're older, the equations get bigger. You have more forehead to put them on. All right. Have a, have a good weekend. I guess if you want to. Don't if you don't want to. Oh, you want to see that now? Yeah. Okay. Take your time with it. Uh, when you're done, I'll be in my office, I guess.